Okay, hi folks. We're back again with another edition of My Life with Robert Burns. We're pleased to have you with us. Uh, Douglas McKenzie and Jim Thompson here again to have a blether with one of our cronies. Hi, Jim. Hi, Douglas. Hi, everybody. Today we're joined by another crony from Ayrshire. Our guest this time is a poet in her own right, and she's recently joined the committee of Alloway Burns Club. Cronies everywhere to tell us about her life with Robert Burns. Please welcome Joelyn Crawford. Hi everyone. Hi Douglas. Hi Jim. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's just such an honour to be here. <laughs> uh, you're very, very welcome. I'm delighted to have you here. Could maybe start off by telling us a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, um, I'm 55 and I was originally born in Dorai, North Ayrshire, um, which is a great Bunce Club. Um, I have a brother. Um, two wee nephews, although I say wee nephews, they're like 14, 45, and they have really nice wives and families. And when I was about 21, I sort of went searching for the big bright lights and went away down to London. And um, I, when I was in London, I was sort of kind of doing modelling. Then I moved into what like kind of promotional modelling, like the car show and all that kind of stuff. And then as I get older, I moved into sales for most companies I've worked for over the years, Procter & Gamble, Walkers, all those kind of companies. And my last company I worked for was in the last five years was Ferrero Rocher Chocolate, which is a little bit tempting when you've always got chocolates in your car. <laughs> <laughs> but while I was down in London, um, at one point I owned a um, tanning shop franchise. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, called The Tanning Shop. And that was in Chancery Lane, just behind the law courts. But long, long story, but I ended up losing a lot of equity. So that, that was just a kind of challenging time. And I was, so I was in London a long, long time. And then my parents get quite sick. So about 15 years ago, I moved back up here. And that's when I was working for Ferrero Rocher up here. Oh, and Dewey. Bets I worked for Dewey. Bets for a while as well. So yeah, I was up here. Um, started, got a wee house in Mabel, which was lovely, and then moved up to Somme, and now I'm in a little village called Rankinston, I'm just moving to Dalrymple soon, and um, sadly, five years ago, which is actually quite a big part of my life, so I will sort of kind of tell you about it, but I had some kind of breakdown linked to childhood trauma, and I wasn't very well for quite a long time, and sadly, it affected my sight. And I had um, quite a lot of surgeries in my sight. So I've lost a lot of sight in this eye. But still see and, you know, pray to God that it never gets any worse. Um, so that was quite challenging. And I lost a lot of confidence because uh, when I was down south, I've always been involved with creative stuff. I studied creative writing at Open University and I studied music theory with the Royal School of Music and was involved in amateur theatre and in bands and things like that. And when I was really sick, I lost the ability to sing. I lost the ability to hear pitch, but it was really like difficult if you sing. And I've had to, over the years, retrain myself. So my confidence is not quite where it used to be, but I'm finding my way. Um, and it's kept sort of kind of coming back. But yeah, that was a huge time in my life. And that was only five years ago. So I'm still, I think it takes a long time to get over something like that. Although I know everyone gets something, you know, I think we all get something, but that was kind of mine. And that kind of like, led me into um, like, meeting other people. That was when I met um, like Tracy and involved with all kind of different things then. Um, the first step back out into the world, I went to the Burns Festival four years ago. Do you remember the, the brilliant Burns Festivals that we were having? And there was a wee poetry tent. And I thought, oh, wow, a poetry tent, I'll go in there. And that's where I met like people at Jean Hill House, Cathy Costello, Tracy. It was all linked to Cameron's um, monthly monologues. And I started going there and that helped me get back. So that was my kind of way back into the world and sort of with my writing and yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at. I just write now, live a wee quiet life, play my wee ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, my take you, let, <laughs> let, let, let's take you back to, to some of that earlier stuff. You, 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 where did you go to school? Um, I went to school at Dorai Primary and then mm -hmm. um, Garnock Academy in Coburnley. We had uh, an ex-teacher from Garnock Academy on to our podcast last week, uh, John Hodgert. Did you oh. ever come across John? 
Yeah, John's a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, I love John Hodger. Um, John and myself were in a drama group. Well, uh, we were, there was a drama group in Dorian. I was in it as a young girl, and the lady that was running it sadly died. And John took over, and he said to me, I'm really sorry, but I'm not keeping the youth drama group going. But the day you turn 16, you come back. The day I turn 16, I was on their door. Please let me in. <laughs> So uh, yeah, John. John's so talented, and he's wrote an amazing book about the Witch of Dorai. And yeah, he's a wonderful man. Yeah, uh, we had a good we had a good chat with him. Um, so people will have seen that by the time we we get to this podcast, so they'll know what we're talking about. Oh, I'm looking um, forward to that. <laughs> yeah, I, and London, you skip you skip very quickly over over London. So how many years were you there? Um, oh, uh, I've probably been there about twenty something years. Yeah. I think, well, my maths, yeah, 21 years, I think. Yeah, and, and how did you enjoy life in London? Um, initially, because I was so kind of go-getting when I was younger, you know, really go-getting when I was younger, so I loved it. You know, the life was really fast, and, um, yeah, and there was loads, because although I kind of come across quite bubbly and stuff, I'm quite, I've got quite an academic brain, so I like to study everything, and there's loads, there was loads to do. You know, there was loads of courses to go on, and there was always a history thing happening, and, yeah, I just absolutely loved it. But as I got older, it got too fast. You know, I just thought, and then my mum and dad was sick, so yeah, it kind of brought me. I think your roots is where you're born, and although you go away and you get this amazing life experience, you've really got to come back to where you're from. It's like it's like your soul is pulling you back, it's driving you back. You know. Yeah, I worked in London for a couple of years, and I, I and I've got to admit that um, while I enjoyed the buzz while I was there, I, I was always keen to be home at the weekends. It was. Uh, uh, it wasn't a life I wanted to get too used to. Mm. It is a bit too fast. And people are not kind. I'm not saying they're not kind people, but they're not kind in the outside. So they'll bump into you. No one will ask you how you are. I used to smile at everybody in the tube and they would look at me as if there's something wrong. You know, I'd be like, oh, hi. And they'd go, oh, really strange person smiling at me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I find the, the only people that talk to you in the tube were, were, were fellow Scots or Australians. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, and you talked about being in, in various uh, creative ventures and you talked about bands. What kind of bands were you in? Um, I was in a country rock band for years. Um, and when I was much younger, I was really lucky in the fact that I was signed to some, it was like a small kind of country label. And they kind of taught me how to record and how to kind of put wee twiddles in my voice, which actually I lost a lot, an awful lot, yeah, as I say, when I, I wasn't very well. But yeah, I was, uh, was staying under the wing with this like really lovely, um, what was it, a man and his wife, and they were great. So yeah, I was doing that for quite a few years. and. Um, I was kind of singing in wee clubs and things like that, yeah, as well as doing sales. <laughs> sales has always been my kind of thing. And, and latterly it was Ferrero Rocher, you said? Yeah, I was there for, yeah. a, for a long time. Yeah, did you get a chance to go to the, the plant in Italy? No, but um, we, I mean, we had like lots of really nice meetings, so we always had films from there and things like that. Um, and towards the end, they changed, they kind of um, sold the sales part over to um, like an agency that, that kind of, you know, made us into kind of almost like boxes, you know, uh, you need X amount of minutes to make X amount of money and things like that. Whereas before it was about go in, speak to the people, be a friend, get to know them and, and sell them Ferrero Roshi properly. But then it became more of a business towards the end. I think that's why it wasn't working for me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I used to pass the plant. I, I it was with Diageo, and we had a plant out in Santa Vittoria in Italy. And I used to pl pass the, the Ferrero Rocher plant and uh, plan to to get, get a plant visit because it always fascinated me how you would make make the chocolates and such like. But uh, I never get the opportunity. What what about what about other hobbies? Uh, you've talked a bit about poetry and music. Any other hobbies? Um, yeah, I used to, um, again, before that, that sort of happened to me five years ago, I used to be involved in um, radio at UWS. So I was on a breakfast show with John Davison and I was a film reviewer, so I love films. I used to go to the movies all the time. And I'm a member of U3A, I don't know if it's a bit like Opportunities in Retirement, and I'm involved with a philosophy group, which is just great. 
and I go I have a church in Presswick St Ninians. That's my own church. Um, I'm really quite involved now sing worship music in there again all creative stuff and I'm a member of um, the Compass Theatre Group and um, which I'm hoping to get a part in the next couple of years but every Covid stopped everything and I volunteered at Food Bank I'm really passionate about that I love volunteering at the Food Bank. Which one is which Food Bank is it? Um, it's the Trussell Trust it's down uh, in, in Presswick yeah at New Life Church yeah yeah, I mean, food banks are fantastic. It's just a, oh, right. a shame that we need them. So, see, see if you have someone come in and they've just, I mean, it could be someone that's just had something unfortunate happen to them that day, you know, like they, their wallet gets stolen with their salary in it, you know, it can be, it can be anything. And they come in and people find it hard coming in and see when you're able to really help them. And we've got loads of stuff just now and we can give them like a big bar of chocolate and something nice to help. It's, Honestly, you come home and your heart's all swollen. It's amazing. Okay. Well, I, I, I was going to say that your uh, your interest in films is uh, is duplicated by my fellow interviewee. Um, Jim's a great film buff, and I'm, I think we could probably manage a, an episode about film, but uh, we won't do that. We'll get you talking a bit about your interest in Robert Burns. So I'll pass over to Jim to start that. The first question is very easy, as always. How did you get started with Burns? Oh, well, Burns, for me, is kind of in my blood, being from Ayrshire. So um, when I was a wee girl, uh, you know, I knew all about Dorai Burns Club. I mean, Dorai Burns Club is amazing. Um, and it was very much drummed into you, you know, you'll never be able to join that. That's a man's world. You know, so I've felt that since I was a wee tot, really. And, um, but I was passionate about it. I was always like, oh, one day, hopefully they'll let me in, you know, I'm still like that. And they ran um, competitions in the school. And it was Alistair Sims' mum who you, uh, you interviewed Alistair a few weeks ago. Alistair is best friends with my wee nephew. And uh, yeah, I remember going to this competition. It was the Twa Dogs. And I was so chuffed, you know, I was like reciting the Twa Dogs. And I, I got second prize, but there was also a wee music bit and I sang and I was devastated when I came away. So I was, I was crying. My dad was saying, why are you crying? You've got second prize. I was like, you have all those other girls, they can all sing because they go to singing lessons and I never, because I sound you silly. <laughs> <laughs> and all I could think of it was how bad I did in the singing bit. And that I, it went over my head that I'd won this competition, we'll get second prize. But yeah, from there, it just always kind of was around. And then when I moved down south, I, I, it was just in the back of my mind that women, it wasn't a women's world. I know that sounds crazy now, but back then, I really just thought that. So I ended up having my own wee bun suppers every year. And I've always kind of been around a bit writers and stuff. So people would do their own work. Or we'd do a wee, a wee rabbi, bears or whatever. And then when I moved back up, Oh, it, it was amazing actually it's like a really really important day in my life was um the first kind of real step back into the world and I think I mentioned it was a Burns Festival um and uh, I went in it was a poetry tent and I went away in and that I seen all these people reciting Burns and their own poetry and I thought wow I'd love to be a part of that and to cut a long story short, I ended up going to this night on a Monday night and I met people at Tracy, heard Tracy do Betty Through the Wall for the first time, was blown away. And I started doing my own poetry. And from there, um, Tracy invited me to your, um, and I think, do you call it your interclub night at New Coming Up Buns Club? Or do you? We, call we, we, we called it a Scots First Night. Scots first night I couldn't quite remember and um, so she invited me along to a Scots first night and I was sat next to Willie Dick of all people <laughs> and uh, that was my first real like night of being in a real burn setting because I, I for me it was massive because I didn't think I'd ever get in there because I didn't think women were allowed in and that changed my, my life literally overnight um and from there, it, it went really fast because I was going to, I met yourself, Douglas, and when we were going to the lectures at the Burns Museum, I went to every lecture, I think, and i uh, done the courses with the Glasgow University, just a wee small free courses. So he's always been around in my life, but it's only now in the last few years that it, I'm able to be part of it. 
I just didn't think I'd ever be able to be part of it because I thought it was a man's world. See, we're finding out it's not just, and I, don't get me wrong, I absolutely understand it and I have no, I, I understand the culture and I understand why a lot of clubs, it's men only. But for me finding out I can get into some clubs, it's like somebody's opened a golden door. Do you know what I mean? It's amazing. <laughs> You're involved with Halloween now as well. And how, how did that start up? Uh, well, I was, I, to be honest with you, I spent a lot of time thinking about a club because I wanted it to be the right club and I really toyed with Presswick as well. And I kept looking online and kind of like, just genuinely kind of listening around. And I just knew, and the first night I went along, I just knew with the people. Do you know when you just absolutely no and I thought this is just the club for me and very quickly they've asked me onto the committee so I'm really thankful about that but I'm also joining the Irvine Lassies because the Irvine Lassies is very important because my mum's from Irvine so when I was growing up I was taken to Irvine every Saturday to see my aunts and my uncles and my gran and my, I think ugh, need to find out for sure um because he died before i was born but i think my papa played in urban burns club so there's this real tie to urban so to be invited along to um, the urban lassies has been really kind of great and that's their mingle night tonight so i've been along to that <laughs> well, I mean, uh, urban lassies are one of the best burns clubs that i've ever had any involvement with and and, and i praise them at every turn because they're wonderful oh. and and if you're getting in with that crowd, if you like, you're in with, with real experts and, and folk who are just nice folk to be about. Um, but you, I, you're involved with the bachelor, the, the, the rejuvenation of the Bachelors Club on the first Tuesday of the month. How did you start with that? Well, way back, um, like the, the original kind of, I would say kind of the genesis of the idea, there was this wee night was run way before anyone else kind of picked up on it. There was this wee um, creative night was running. And it was only me and Rosie, Rosie Mapplebeck, that turned up. And I don't know if you know a band called the Borl and Kelly Band. Oh, they're fan oh. fantastic. And along we went, and it was just us, and they were so gracious. And here was me just kind of learning my wee ukulele and trying to kind of get back. And they, were, they just allowed us to be free. It was my first time ever in the Bachelors Club. And honestly, it was like, you felt this presence. And there was one night, actually, you know how they've got these beautiful um, plates and things on the, the tables? This plate literally just jumped and fell and smashed. Nothing happened, nobody touched it, and everybody was freaked out. We were like, what was that? And we thought we were going to get charged an absolute fortune from the National Trust to pay for this. Luckily, it was covered by insurance and things, but yeah, we all thought we were going to get charged. But yeah, th there was maybe about four, four of those sessions, possibly five. I think there was only four. Jean Hillhouse came to one, and not enough people was kind of picking up, so they stopped it. And then... Um, there was a kind of meeting down at the museum and they spoke about it and it kind of took over and then it was Tracy and Willie and then yourself, Douglas, who's managed to just expand it massively online. So you have been there right from the very beginning. It's been very special for me. And also the Debating Society. Hugh Farrell started up the Debating Society and that was in there too. And we have some, we've had some good first debates, but that sadly COVID, everything stopped. <laughs> So I feel, I feel like a wee burns person in a, in a stall at a wee whippet. I'm all ready to go because it's so new for me. And I'm in my wee stall at a wee whippet waiting to go. <laughs> uh, the COVID's been, a, a, particularly in relation to burns suppers, have, have you done any virtual burns suppers? Um, I've done like, a couple of wee ones. And um, I, I, because my burns life only started a few years ago, so I was booked for quite a few that didn't go into Zoom, like the Commandment Zero Club. I was booked to do a dress to the haggis for that, so I was very disappointed that I didn't get to do that. Uh, come on, no, uh, obviously I've been doing it a long time as well. But have you any ambitions? Do you know, is there something you want to achieve within the Burns movement? Oh, just because um, I'm just, I just love studying. So for me, just actually learning so much, not, not to be, I mean, I don't think that would, I'm so kind of 
it's all there in the back of my mind but if you were to ask me something I would freeze I'm not someone that's like that you know I'm more it's more for me to just know as much about the history and the, the background to the poem so I feel there's a life's work in there to find that uh, and to be just to be respected you know like um, as someone that is passionate as everyone else and yeah and to go to suppers, to get invited to suppers. I love a bun supper, do you know what I, And because I've waited all my life to get in, you know, I think, well, actually, no, you say that what I do have one ambition, and that's if Dorai Buns Club ever allowed a woman to a bun supper or ever allowed a woman to perform at a bun supper. And although I never see it happening in my lifetime, if they ever allowed a woman to join the club, that that would be me. <laughs> that would be <laughs> one of the people, yeah. Jolyn, one of the things you've become quite well known for is, uh, is writing parodies of, of Burns poems. Um, can you tell us which poems you've, you've written a parody to? Uh, well, I, it started from, um, I've wrote Maggie's Tale, which did kind of change everything for me. That opened a lot of doors for me. But I did write it deliberately for a Burns audience. So it's written, it is Tamashanta, which um, your book, I have to say, Jim, has, oh, just put it up. This book is amazing. <laughs> and this is like a Bible to me. You know, I don't read it and then put it down. I don't use it like that. I use it like a Bible. It's just got so much of it, Tama Shanton in there. And so T Maggie's tale is the exact tale of Tama Shanta, but it is written down like deliberately for an audience. So it's got like light-hearted humour in there. It's like the perspective of the horse. So it's meant for people that's had a couple of drinks. They're kind of not in that really serious place anymore. And also for people that don't know Tama Shanta, it's a step in. Because it's a heavy poem. It's a hard poem. You know, I mean, personally, I love it. I think it's so intelligent. Uh, but yeah, it, so Maggie Steele was written for that. And then I wrote The Twelve Cats. Again, just the same kind of thing. The Twelve Cats is a kind of tale about two wee cats for air from two completely different lives. The same as the Twelve the Dogs is a highly intelligent piece of it, two dogs for, um, for two different complete class systems. Well, it's the same with the Twelve Cats, but it's funny. It's just yeah, written, written again for a bum's audience. So I Any write... Oh, sorry. Go on, you go. I was just going to say, I, before, before um, I met people like Tracy and Jean Hillers, I wrote very serious, heavy poetry, very introspective, uh, uh, much more kind of aligned with when you study like creative writing, you're making sure you've got alliteration, you're making sure you've got all these enjambments and things like that. I don't write so much like that now. I've got much more like light-hearted approach to it. I'm more about writing to kind of make people smile. Or, or teach people that don't know anything about rabbit buttons. A wee step in, a wee funny step. Oh, well, what's the talk cat? It's about, oh, but there's a poem about the tour dogs. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, we, we, we've talked, and or you've talked about the, these poems. Any chance you could give us a, an extract from oh. one or both of them? Well, I can maybe give you the... The last verse, I'll read it just for so because I've not done them for a wee while with COVID, you know. And I could give you the last verse, uh, the Twa Cat. So it's Princess Tulula and We Scampy. And it's about, it's the last verse. I think it's off a sad, you know. And um, it's all about the, the wee love affair and how it's like destined to not to work kind of thing. So it's the last wee verse all about We Scampy. We Scampy. He did. Lonely, sad, and broken hearted, in a damp, dark alley by the old fish market. A sad, sick, they luck lying there, all skinny and skanky, riddled with fleas, pure minging and manky. But if you took it as hurt, it'd be swollen with love so fat. Cause you can, he was a right good soul. He was a cat's a cat. For all that. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> but it's got about 24 verses before it gets there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and what about uh, what about the other one? Any chance of a verse of that as well? Um, what Maggie's tale? Um, yeah. Well, believe it or not, Jim, you I wrote Maggie's tale, right? And then I listened to your lectures. Remember, you done that brilliant lecture. I think it was linked to Tamfest. Oh, that was the one that was bombed. 
yeah, like, yeah, that was a bit scary, wasn't it? But yeah, you said so much and I realised that I had took the Haley table and that whole kind of time and I had just put it into one sentence really. And I thought after listening to you, I thought, you know, I've really got to go away and write something else. So I wrote this completely new verse um, and for like poets out there, they'll, they'll understand I've made it completely different to the rest of the poem. So it's got like double um, rhymes in it and it's got a lot of alliteration and things like that, but I've just made it so different so that when it comes in, it's got a different feel, but it's actually because of your lecture <laughs> that I wrote this. So, well, I could give you the wee verse before and the wee verse after, so it doesn't sound too kind of yep. strange. Um, so Maggie's tale is basically uh, all about um, the grey mare, Maggie, and it takes you through the poem just in a much more light-hearted way, but it's her perspective, it's how she sees Tam and the whole experience. So they've um, just come up to um, Aya and they're kind of like, they've seen kind of um, at the, the old church and everything, so at the old cut. There were some office six that only belong in hell, did wains and friends stories too hard to tell. Folks whose souls had been ripped right out, ripe to sell, like Satan's breastfeed. And they were dancing like it was their last farewell, and all their coffins stood emptied. Their all drinkled horns, hod and Connell's faces half mangled. The hilly table scraps a fox, strangle, then dangle. Malady a melody's fever pitched, my brain was scramble and fangle. It was unholy indeed. Flinging off their clays, half dressed in the muck, they wrangle and fangle. The deal's living undeed. Then Nanny's cut his sack coat Randy Tam's eye. Well, it was off a shot, it was ripped up her thigh, but a witch you just can't beautify, but she still shimmied. Tam's lust called out, it went dark to signify a stompied. And then it carries on for there for the chaser and <laughs> so she's a retail. And oh, yeah, no. she gets off a sad about a retail. So it takes oh, you slightly past the, the poem because it's a bit quite painful for her. <laughs> Excellent. And have you any plans to do any other poems? Well, I'm always writing stuff. So I've got a lot on the go, but there's one that needs an awful, an awful lot of study. So I'll be using Jim's book for that. I'm hoping to write something about the real nanny somehow um, and about a louse being on her. So I'm going to try to Oh, I'm going to really study a lot more about the um, tail owls and some really kind of like read Jim's book much more about the real nanny and kind of, and somehow, because it's a, an organic thing, you've just got to kind of, as long as you do, the background I always find it comes to you, you know, if you're creative, well you guys are creative as well and you write poetry too, um, but it, you've, you've got to just kind of wait, do you know that way in the right words and yeah. Very good. And, and you mentioned that you're going to get involved with the museum. What, what's, the, what's the plan there? Um, well, I spoke to Chris just a, a couple of weeks ago, um, last week actually. It's always been in the back of my mind about volunteering, but obviously not being very well and having to kind of like get myself back into the world. And I felt, because I'm moving to Dalrymple, and it's only 10 minutes away, that I thought to myself, you know, this would be the right time. You know, just because I'm passionate, I'm passionate about mums, you know, it's like, I feel as if it's in my blood. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's certainly plenty of people who, who are volunteers and involved with the museum that, that, that are good to be around. I mean, yeah. Hugh's just a marvellous individual. Yeah, is that Hugh you said? Yeah. Yeah, Hugh Farrow, yeah, I really respect Hugh Farrow, I think he's a wonderful man. And getting to know him more through, like, the bachelors and... Um, the debating society is just is, is someone you can't help but respect he even speaks and you you kind of sit back with respect does that make sense <laughs> and i've seen him like um like at bun suppers and stuff and his knowledge blows me away i learn so much i'm sometimes writing we like bits down to the side thing oh i didn't know that <laughs> 
The, the other thing we, we, we talked about uh, before we started recording was uh, the, the fact that you, you play um, the ukulele. Um, I don't know if you play any other instruments. Um, I play very basic piano and guitar. Eventually, I'll probably swap the, the ukulele for a guitar, but I'm not good enough because I only mm -hmm. picked an instrument up three years ago because I studied theory and um, I'd always kind of sang, so it was more about writing music. And obviously then when this all happened to me, part of getting better was to learn an instrument and it helped me to repitch. So I had to kind of, it's odd, if you imagine, say, say that part of your brain pitches music, I had to relearn, like I have to see it now as if it's on a piano and hear it and then pitch it. It's odd. I just do it a different way around there. And, and, and you're playing your own or do you play as part of a, a ukulele orchestra? Um, I just play my own, but long term I'd really quite like to maybe be in a wee band or something or something, yeah. Well, we, we, we've talked about it. Is there any chance you can give us a, a song with your, oh, your ukulele? I could wait to have a wee drink then. Um, and if you don't mind, I just need to check it. So I should be in tune. I have just learned John Anderson, my Joe. Uh, the one thing I'm guilty of, so I apologise about it beforehand, is that um, I know, I, I'll maybe read the, the sheet music and I know how exactly it should be sung. And then I go to play it and I... Always seem to have this wee jazzy twist on it. So I know that not everyone likes that. So I just don't seem to be able to sing it straight. So, <laughs> so I apologise beforehand that it might not sound exactly the way you I, I, I think jazzy twists are okay. I think we've, that okay? We, 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 we've talked before in these podcasts about the, the importance of Burns being a, a, a wide or a broad church and people interpret Burns in whatever way they. They feel it's right to interpret it, so you you go. Oh, thank you. Well, that's encouraging for me because I always think that oh, I'll be making people cross because it's not quite right. <laughs> So there's a couple of e chords there that was a wee bit of <laughs> <laughs> So that was very good. Well done. But, and I wouldn't worry about individual, you know, artists. Artists have got the freedom, and, and the, I always say to folk, if any reader gets away with it, so can everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> person it's maybe linked to being a Christian and kind of my family like kind of just the way they brought me up but I was always I've always get this thing that you know you should try and you know upset people do you know that kind of way and maybe because I've got such a I kind of revere for the Burns world because I've tried to get into it well I, I was hoping for so long and no knowing that I could there was an opening for women maybe because I have that there's a kind of fear of people thinking we, we don't really enjoy that. You would want people to kind of like it. Do you know that kind of way? So I think it's linked to that. I think it's linked to just maybe trying to please people too much. Maybe I'm a people pleaser. But <laughs> so I, having, having taken the step to, to, to join a club and, and now join the committee, um, do, do you see yourself 
taking taking office within a club? Oh, what in years to come? I, that would be a, yeah. I would love something like that. I don't know enough yet, and I'm no um, I'm no astute enough in things yet. But yeah, in the future, that would be amazing. Yeah. And I mean, I'm that wee sponge. I love learning from people, and I'm really um, I like to be involved in things. I like all the things that happen like the um Alloway does the, the primary seven competitions so I'm really looking forward to that you know I, I just enjoy all the things that happen you know I enjoy all the, the wee trips I love all the wee trips and things and and going to the monument and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we talked about uh, the, the fact that you, you've done some parodies are there any other of Burns's poems that you'd want to parody? Um, not at the moment, because um, I'm kind of, I think when I write this new poem, it'll be a wee bit more serious, because I wrote them so that, and really actually so that I had something to do at Burns Suppers, because I, again, I was like, well, what if I don't do Burns well enough, you know, <laughs> like, but if I wrote something that was funny, because uh, I do, I mean, I do address to the Haggis, um, and I'm going to learn Parnassus Hill, because I absolutely love Parnassus Hill, um, but I think I'll, I'm feeling more confident to write something more serious now, I think. We, we've um, we've never had MD do the haggis on our podcast yet. Um, if we ask you to do that, would you be up <laughs> oh, for that? I need to. I hope it's in the. I've not done it, since, so hopefully it'll be there. Yeah, I could get a go. Just the first couple of verses, then yeah. Well, you can, if you uh, do the whole thing, if you want. No, no, I don't think. I don't think I would have the confidence to because it's uh, maybe we would be there, but I, do you know? I think I'd rather just do a couple of verses. Would that be all right? That would be lovely. <laughs> just, because I, I haven't, do you know when you've not done it for a while? But I, I'll get a go. Fear for your own as soon as you face, great chieftain of the pudding race. Ah, bin them all, you tack your place. Pange, trite, a fame. Wheel, a you are then. Oh, a grace as lang's my aim. The groaning trencher, there you fill. Your huddies, what a distant hill. Your pin would help to mend a mill in time of need. And through your pores, the juice distill the amber beads. <laughs> I don't think I'd like to go beyond that in case I forgot the words. <laughs> well, no, yeah. Have you done it live yet at a bon supper? Yeah, I've done it a few. Yeah, and I've done it for the Burns Museum as well. Well, for, for, for an old man, can I give you a wee tip? Oh, yes, please. Al always check your haggis first, just to make sure, one, it's no frozen, and two, <laughs> it's not going to burn you if you touch it. <laughs> oh, yeah, but my finger down. <laughs> yeah. I went, um, you, you know when you put the knife in? Yeah. I did that at... Um, it was, oh, where was it? It was, it was with Lily Dick. And um, yeah, I put, put the knife in and it went like that and the haggis started spraying up and everyone. <laughs> and I was like, oh, haggis sticking to my face and everything. Well, there was, there was a man from you called Andrew Jess, who, who was a, an old police, he was in the travel department and he did the, the burns, he did the haggis at the, the police bug supper every year and year. And if you're sitting in the first six rows, you needed to visit a dry cleaner. <laughs> oh yeah i mean i would love it would really be nice if i was ever asked to do it from my own club because they do that supper at brigadoon so that would be really special as well i went to their supper obviously and um, couldn't this year because of covid the year before and it, you're you're walking up and the pipers playing i think because it's in the brigadoon you know all the hairs in my arms were all i was in tears do you know i was like oh my goodness i'm going to the brigadoon <laughs> yeah it, it was i think i've just found the right club do you know when you find the right club for yourself you just know by all these these special moments i know exactly what you mean because yeah. half <laughs> Because it is, it's, it's such, I think it's such a personal, emotional journey because when you listen to other people speak, everyone's got a slightly different take in Robert Burns and we all take our own personal thing from it. I mean, I personally absolutely love the talks recently about I'm having mental health issues, you know, about I'm having bipolar disorder and, you know, just hearing all these scientific things, no one will absolutely ever know. No one will ever know, but it's the fact that there's so much out there to have all these different elements and all these different strands where you can 
think to yourself, wow, you know, could that have created this and could that have created that? And it's a never ending learning journey. Yeah, I, and, and the thing is, if, if you read what he's written, it, it, it's no hidden. And you're talking about mental health issues. Anybody who reads the vision knows that the writer of that has got mental health issues. Well, I think that, I think, I mean, obviously I've spoken to people who don't, who don't believe that um, he had mental health issues and they think that he just had a hard life. I'm like you, I, I believe that he did. I just don't think that anyone had any clue back then what that was. We're only now getting worse for it. And, uh, and most people have something. I think as you get older, you realise that everybody hits dark times. And if we don't hit dark times, then we, we don't experience life. And creative people seem to hit dark times more. The more creative you are, the darker the times, sadly. But it's part of the creative journey, I suppose. And I mean, some he's work, I mean, I've got so much he's work still to discover because it's still all fail. I mean, although I was studying a lot of his kind of like well-known stuff, he's more, he's more kind of intricate stuff that you need to do a lot more background into. That's still all new to me. I'm still discovering that. So I feel I've got a great big pie in front of me and I'm just at the wee corner of it. I'll just put my fork in, do you know, that way. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to it. That's, that, that's brilliant. And, and, and when you move to Dalrymple, obviously there's, you're in, in a slightly different area. So there's, there's going to be lots of learning about uh, the Dalrymple area as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been over there a lot because before I made the decision to move there, I drove over and I've done the walks, the walks are beautiful. And just the people, you know, there's really, really friendly people there. And there's just, again, that thing, because I trust that gut instinct, being Christian as well, I trust, I trust that. And that I just knew again, I thought that I feel this is where I have to go. And then when I got this house, it's, excels my expectations. I cried actually again. I'm, I'm an emotional person, me. <laughs> I'm not crying, I'm laughing. <laughs> Jim, is there anything else that we want to ask Julian about or do we want to try and talk her into giving us a, a another bit of poetry or another wee song? Well I think we could get another wee song off her but, but I've got a very personal question for her given her, her working history. Were you ever invited to the ambassador's party? Oh, no, I don't even know what that is. You worked for Ferrera Rocher for years and you were never at the ambassador's party. Oh, you mean from the, the adverts? <laughs> 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 Do you know what? One year, though, I mean, it was amazing. One year they took us to a, a theme park and we had one meeting in the theme park and we were all on roller coasters and stuff. They did have, like, great ideas. They were a really, like, kind of forethinking company. <clears throat> Well, I, I'm, I'm now disappointed and sad because I thought the ambassador's party was real and it's only an advert. No, it's only an advert. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting near the end now, so have you got something you can give us to, before we finish up? Uh, well, I have a wee poem which is a wee bit more serious. Uh, I actually wrote it for Marie Curie years, uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, there was a, a radio show that we did and it was all about Marie Curie and we interviewed the nurses and people like involved with it. So this was a poem that I wrote because they always have the daffodils. So it's called Spring Sacrifice. If a daffodil should bleed, winds shaking the seed, carrying the chills in the air, to where? If you were gasping last breath, so close to death, deep hunger, starvation and pain, would I keep you alive one more moment to thrive? Momentarily insane, a deep cut in one vein, physical feeding sacrifice. Food to your lips, blood in your soul. One life source supporting the other. So can a flower bleed, releasing its seed? I genuinely do believe so. Lovely. Very I nice. I don't think I've done that at the bachelor's before. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that, that was lovely. So we're, we're running out of time. So it really just leaves me with the, the, the time to say to you, thank you very much for coming along and telling us about your poetry and also about your life with Robert Burns. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've had a great wee time. <laughs>